Hello, welcome to our talk today. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Vince. I'm from Austin, Texas, and I work on FPGA compilers based on LLVM. Hi, I'm Felipe. I also work on our FPGA compiler, and I'm from Toronto, Canada. This is a tutorial that we put together about the LLVM intermediate representation, or simply known as the IR. We'll, uh, I'll be given the first part of the talk, and Felipe will do the rest. So how many experienced developers are there in the room today? Okay, how many beginners do we have in LLVM and maybe IR? Okay, so I think some of you will see some benefit from this. If, if, uh, if you're an experienced developer, you can maybe take this back to some of your, your new hires or, or you know, people that may need a, a refresher in IR. Um, so why have a basic tutorial about IR in a conference for LLVM developers? Well, this has been requested by attendees in the past. And many developers come from a mix of backgrounds and skills. And so some developers also kind of get, you know, pigeonholed into doing things like infrastructure and builds and things like that. And maybe they want to, you know, uh, push the horizons of their skills and, and learn more than just these things. So we, we thought a tutorial like this would be useful. So if, if we were to put together a tutorial about how to learn the IR, this is how we would do it. Um, if you're familiar with these concepts, please bear with us. Uh, we do consider this a community project, so we very much want to hear feedback from you on how to improve this tutorial. We assume no previous IR knowledge, but this is not a lecture about compiler theory either. So we will cover some, some compiler theory just to introduce this to you, but we will not go into any great depth here. <coughs> After this tutorial, you should be able to understand the common LLVM tools. You should be able to write and comprehend simple ER, IR, and be able to understand and use the language reference to inspect compiler-generated IR. So what is the IR? IR is a low-level programming language. It's a risk light instruction set, something like an abstract assembly language. If you look at IR, you'll see things like loads and stores and arithmetics. IR must be able to represent high-level language ideas. So it must be able to represent many things that source languages can do. And it also enables efficient code optimization. So how is IR represented? One way is in bit code. Another way is in human readable form that we call LL files. Bit code files can be converted to LL files using a tool called LLVM dis. And LL files can be converted to bit code files using a tool called LLVM as. There is another form that's called in-memory representation that we will not cover today, but you just in case you want to go read about this, you, you can. The focus of the presentation will be on the ELO form. We'll show you some examples, and we'll walk through these with you. So how does IR fit into the compile process? So suppose you start with a main.cpp. We compile this file using Clang. That creates an IR file. This can be optimized. And then suppose we have a factorial.c which you will see in the presentation. We use this as a teaching example. Factorial.c can be compiled into an IR file using Clang. It can be optimized. These optimized IR files can be linked, and then they can be lowered to target machine code. So you can see here that the IR is the centerpiece of the L of, of, of the L of VM development kit. And so it's important to understand IR to some degree in order to understand how, how IR is used throughout the, the tool flow. So now that we've seen where the IR is used, let's take a look at, at its internal elements. So we'll be showing these diagrams throughout the presentation so that you can maintain some context for some of the low-level details that we're talking about. So let's start with a module. A module has target information. It contains global symbols zero or more global variables, zero or more function declarations, and zero or more function definitions. That's what the star is, in case you don't know what that is. And it contains some other stuff that we're not going to go into detail about here today. But you can uh, look, at, look at that later. So what's inside of a function? A function contains zero or more arguments, an entry basic block, and zero or more basic blocks. What's inside of a basic block? A basic block contains a label, zero or more fee instructions, 
and zero or more instructions followed by a terminator instruction. So let's look at some sample target information just to see what's inside of a module. An IR module always starts, or usually starts with a pair of strings describing the target. So in this particular example, we have Indianus information, we have mangling information, we have ABI alignment information, and we also have information about the native integer widths. We also have information about, we also have a target triple, which describes the architecture that the module is to be targeted to, uh, to compile to, the vendor, the system, and the ABI. So let's look at a basic main program and see how this is represented in the IR, just as, as a starting point. And, and you'll see that we'll use these examples as we continue and we'll build upon these as, as the presentation progresses. So this is a main function that calls a factorial function. And you can see that the main function takes an int arc C, takes a char double star arc V, it returns the result of calling factorial with an argument of two, times seven, checking for equivalence to 42. So how does this look in IR? First, there's a function declaration for factorial. You can see that there's a declare statement here which declares that this is a function declaration. There are 32-bit integer definitions that, are, that we call I32 in the IR, and there's the function name factorial. <coughs> then, we have <coughs> then we have the main declaration, the, the main definition. So this is, there's a defined statement that says this is a main function definition. There is an I32 arc, arc C, an I double star arc V, the next IR statement is a call to factorial, takes an argument of, of two of type I32, and factorial, the, the result of the factorial is returned to a variable that we call percent one. The next statement is a multiply that you've seen in the C code. This, this statement multiplies the variable percent one times seven and returns that to percent two. And then there's an integer comparison of that result to I42 returning that result to percent three. The next statement is a zero extension of the result from I compare to I32, which is then returned from the main function. And you can see in this example, this is a sequentially executing series of IR instructions. This will become important later as we talk about other concepts. So what were the percent variables that we saw in the previous example? These are called virtual registers. And these are, these are also known as local variables. There are two flavors of these names. There are un, unnamed virtual registers. In this case, there's percent one, percent two, and percent three. And these are sequen usually sequentially increasing in the IR. Then there are named virtual registers. In this case, there's a percent result. I, the LLVM IR has an infinite number of registers. That leaves register allocation as a problem for the back end. So as we mentioned before, IR is a very strongly typed language. You'll, you'll see many types uh, throughout the generated IR. Having types in the IR makes it easier to follow and reason about. So what does this example look like if we were to move all the code except for the types? This is interesting. So you'll see types on pretty much every line. And some types you'll see, uh, some lines you'll see two different types. Note that the instructions explicitly dictate the types expected. This makes it easier to figure out the argument types and easy to figure out the return types for the most part, and we'll talk about that. So you can see that the call to I32 <laughs> returns an I32 and accepts an I32. The usage of zero extension accepts an I1 and extends that to an I32. The multiply and the I compare are not so obvious, but we'll talk about this. The IR has no implicit conversions. So what would happen in this case if we were to remove this instruction and try to return percent three? Can anybody tell me? Yep, exactly. So you'll see an error like this, it says percent three defined with type I1, but expected I32. So why is that? 
is because main is defined to return an I32. So there is a way to check this if you wish to do so. You can use the opt tool with a verify flag, and this will tell you that if these <laughs> issues exist or not. And this is useful for writing your own IR or debugging compiler-generated IR. So let's talk about the language reference, and we'll come back to some of the other things that we mentioned. We talked about a handful of instructions, but have not showed you where to find the information yet that you might need. So for example, the I compare and the, uh, the multiply instruction. Instructions often have many variants. So just looking at the call instruction, you can see in this particular case, why, what else would a call instruction possibly need? So you can see the call instruction language reference here. It defines the call instruction. There's a syntax definition here. And we'll add our instruction here just for reference so you can uh, correlate the instruction we had in our example with the information that's in the syntax section. Percent one corresponds to the result. There is a call instruction here that corresponds to required text. <coughs> and the I32 at factorial in the list of arguments is also required. Some more information, overview arguments. There's information about semantics. And here are plenty of examples in this particular case for you to look at. And at this point, I'll turn over the rest of the presentation to Felipe. Thank you. All right. Um, now that I have our basic information about the IR, we are ready to look at some more complicated code and where some of the, the most peculiar features of the LVM IR uh, reside. For that, um, let's try to look at how we can implement our factorial function first in a recursive way. Um, so we have a simple uh, piece of C code here where we test if our argument is zero. If it is zero, then we just return a constant one. Otherwise, we're gonna recursively call our factorial function and return that times our input argument. To write this in the IR, we can start by using our comment syntax, which is just semicolon. And then we're going to define this factorial function, saying um, that it um, has a, an i32 as an argument, and it also returns this uh, same type of integer. And the first thing we're going to do here is that test for our if statement. So we're essentially comparing our value to 0. And based on the result of this comparison, we want to do two different things, right? We want our code to jump, uh, to, we want to jump to two different points in our code. And here we're using the concept of labels to identify a part of our IR code. We have what we call our base case, which essentially has a single instruction returning one. And in our recursive case, we're going to uh, subtract one from our input, call the factorial function, multiply that value, and eventually return. So now we are seeing some more structure in our functions. In particular, you see that we have some names, uh, uh, some labels, a sequence of instructions that always uh, terminate in a specific way. And this uh, leads us to one of the, the core compiler concepts, which is that of basic blocks. The idea of a basic block is to essentially uh, to model a sequence of ininterruptible instructions. In LLVM IR, in particular, we're going to say that a basic block is a list of non-terminator instructions ending with a terminator. And what is this terminator? It's essentially an instruction that will take our control flow, our executing point of the code to some other point. We've seen two examples so far, branches and return statements, but there are others. We have switches, there, are some, there is an unreachable statement, and a bunch of exception handling instructions. But we're not gonna focus on, those, on these uh, in this presentation. So going back to our example, we can see that we have our first basic block that just has an, a comparison and it terminates with uh, a branch instruction. We have our base case, which simply contains a terminator instruction, and our recursive case also terminates with a return statement. So when we have a return statement, this is essentially transferring the execution of the program to the calling function. Whereas for branch statements, 
we transferred the control flow to another basic block. And we have a special name for this basic block, which is the successor of the currently executing basic block. This successor-predecessor relationship also has a special name, and it's also a classic compiler concept, which we call the control flow graph, um, which essentially, uh, it's, it's a graph where vertices are basic blocks and edges capture the predecessor-successor relationship between them. In this uh, example we have here, um, the label is not shown for the first basic block, that is a mistake, but let's call it entry. So here our control flow graph is saying that our entry has two successors, our base case basic block and the recursive case. If this had been a compiler generated IR, we would have seen that the compiler was kind enough to generate comments saying which basic blocks, uh, what, are, what are the predecessors of a given basic block. Uh, we can have this, uh, those graphs plotted for us by the optimizer itself, if you call it with those flags. Um, and if you want the instructions included in there as well, you can also get there. This might get a little bit cluttered, but it's useful for code inspection. Now, one important feature of uh, basic blocks is that they always have a label, even if it's not explicit. In fact, that's related to the mistake we had in the slides. So, Let's, let's name that first basic block, and let's suppose that we removed that first label, right? Here, is this IR valid or not? Based on what I said before, it should be valid, because they always have a name if it's not explicit, right? But there's a problem here. So, we're gonna get this error message saying, I expected this instruction to be numbered percent one. This is just a technical detail of how the unnamed variables work where we expect them to start with percent zero and count up, but because we didn't give a name to that basic block label, the compiler treat it, treats it as percent zero, so now we're using percent zero twice. So simple fix for that, just rename our variables, and this is also true for function arguments. You don't necessarily have to give them a name, but if you don't, there will be an implicit name there. At this point, we've talked about a lot of the concepts we had in our uh, module diagram. We're still missing global variables and fee instructions. To talk about those, we're gonna, we, we're gonna have to, we need, we're gonna need a more complicated example. So we're gonna implement our factorial function again, but this time in an iterative uh, manner. So how do we go about doing that? This code simply iterates from i equals to two to our input va value, multiplying and accumulating, and eventually we return this temporary va variable. So we're gonna start by initializing two variables here to two and one. This addition to zero is not really necessary. We're gonna get rid of them later, but for now, bear with me. And once we've done this initialization, we want to branch to a piece of code that will test whether we want to execute our loop or not. So how do we do that? We're gonna have a comparison instruction asking is i less than or equal to value? And if so, we want to go to the body of the for loop. If it's not, we want to go to the end of this loop. So in the for body, in the for body itself, the last thing we're gonna do is just return to this, uh, to, to check whether we, we need to keep iterating or not. And once we're done with the loop, we just wanna be able to return this temporary. Now, we really wanna be able to do this. Just update our temporary and our I variables, right? So we would like to do that, but the compiler will say no. You can't do it. So why? Here it's complaining about the multiple definition of a local variable named temp. This is a common thing you would do in a high level language, but you can't really do it in IR. Why? Well, the IR enforces a property called static single assignment. And this is, again, one of those really important uh, compiler concepts and to keep it simple, we're just gonna say that every variable must be assigned exactly once, and every variable must be defined before they are used. So if we go back to what we had before, okay, we can't use the same name twice, so let's give it a different name. But now this code is not very useful, right? Because we are never updating our temporary and our i, we're always returning one, 
and our comparison is always comparing against two. <coughs> to fix this while still enforcing the static single assignment property, or just SSA, uh, we're going to need a more elaborate mechanism. And a very uh, related concept is that of a phi, or phi, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, this, this is an instruction in the IR that will select a value based on where the control flow is coming from. So here, we, the syntax has a type, which is just a type that this fee instruction is going to return. And we're going to say that we want, uh, we want it to take the value 0 if we're coming from a basic block called label 0, or similarly, if our control flow is coming from a basic block labeled label 1, we want it to take value 1. OK, so how do we use this to fix our problem before? Here's the same IR. But now I plotted in a control flow graph way just to make it easier to visualize how the fee instructions are working. So the first thing we're going to do in our check for condition basic block is to select the appropriate value of i. That is, if we're coming from the entry basic block, we want to take our constant 1, whereas if we're coming from the end of the basic block, we want it to be i plus 1. Right? And once we have this, we have to update all other uses of the old i to be this new i. So if you look at the for body, we're just going to replace uh, i with current i. And also, our i in the entry block is now useless. It's not being used anywhere, so we can just remove it. And we're going to do the exact same thing to our temporary. It should be 1 if we're coming from the entry block. And if we're coming from the end of the loop, we just want it to take the form of the new temporary. So we've been able to solve the uh, SSA. We've been able to enforce the SSA property while implementing our for loop. But if we were to look at what the compiler of the front end would have generated, it would have been something different. It would have gotten around this restriction by reading and writing from memory. Now, because every presentation nowadays needs a Godbolt link, let's quickly look at what Compiler Explorer can give us. So you can actually use uh, Compiler Explorer to generate IR. And here I have the exact same code in, as in our example. I'm giving it uh, Clang the emit LLVM flag. So I'm asking it to generate IR instead of machine code. Um, sorry. This is a 1. I actually want 0. Um, and here, O0, and I'm removing debug information. So if you look at this IR, it looks nothing like we had before. It has these alloca instructions, it has some stores and some loads. But if we were to go to our uh, slightly optimized version with O1 here, we have a much more familiar piece of IR. So what is the front end doing here? What is being generated? Well, we're using this alloca instruction, which essentially is a form of memory allocation in a way where you give it a type and it will return you a pointer to that type. So you say alloc i32, you get a pointer to an i32. You say alloc any type, you get a pointer of that type. Uh, this is essentially allocating memory in the stack frame of the currently executing function, and it will be automatically released once you return. So that's one of the reasons you would never return a pointer returned by an alloc instruction. Uh, and as we saw, this really plays a big part in generating IR in this SSA form. It makes it, it a lot easier for the front end to do so. So how do we use those alloc instructions to enforce the SSA property? Again, the same code we had previously. In the entry block, we're now going to allocate space for our <coughs> i, and we're going to store the initial value in that memory uh, region. So we're going to store 2 to the address returned by the alloca. At the end of uh, at the for body, we're going to store to the same memory location the updated value of i. Um, and we, again, in the entry block, we're going to do the same thing to our temporary. So we allocate space for, it, for that. We store the initial value. And again, at the end of the far body, we're going to store the updated value of this temporary to that memory location. At this point, we're pretty much um, we're, we're ready to go to our check for condition basic block. 
and load the correct value from our memory locations, right? So here we are where we had a, a fee instruction, now we simply have loads and stores. Allocus are one way to get memory from uh, in, in the IR, but it's not the only way to do so. Um, another way to use memory is with global variables. So where an allocator gives you memory in the function scope, a global variable represents a memory region that is visible in every basic block of your module. So just like allocators, they are always pointers, and to get a global variable, the syntax is quite simple. It's a name that starts with the at character, and we've seen another, other names with uh, the same prefix. So we saw that function names also had this, and the symbol is essentially used to, to uh, define names that are global symbols, so global, uh, global uh, variables and functions. Continuing with this example, uh, we're going to say that this variable, this global variable has a type. Uh, it must be initialized unless we're simply declaring it and we use the global keyword. Unless this is a special kind of global variable which we call a constant. It essentially says, it essentially means that this thing is never stored to. Now, just as an aside, a lot of people get confused about this. This is not the same as a C++ const uh, keyword. So because the global variables are pointers, whenever you want to use those values, you would load or store from memory. Um, and in particular, because we're, we're doing a memory allocation in, in a static way here, the compiler is able to reason about the address of a global variable at compile time. So we're going to say that those are constant pointers. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into detail about constants but keep that in mind as you look at the IR. <clears throat> now, an interesting fact about global variables is that they are quite complicated if you look at the, the language reference page for them. They have quite a lot of possible qualifiers. Can anyone in this room tell me what each and all of these do? Yeah, I, I can't either, so always check the language reference if you, if you don't know what one of those do. Cool. Uh, we've pretty much covered all of the, 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 the module structure as a whole, but this presentation would not be complete if we didn't talk about possibly one of the most confusing instructions of the LLVM uh, intermediate representation, which are infamous get element pointers or gap instructions. To do so, we're going to take a brief detour to the type system and then come back to, this, to those instructions. From the language reference, if you look at what they say about type systems, it's gonna tell you that we have void types, we have function types, and we have our first class types. Those are essentially types that can be returned by a, an instruction. Among those, we have uh, types that represent a single value. Those are your integers, your floats, your pointers, and we have types representing aggregates, arrays, and structs. There are some other types here, like labels. Labels are actually, uh, they actually have a type metadata, but we're not gonna focus on, on those in this presentation. So let's start with a simple aggregate type, which is that uh, of an array, and build from there. An array is simply defined, well, it needs a name. In this case, we're defining a global variable, but an array essentially has a size, so that is the number of elements in the array, and a type. Because here we have a global variable, we also need an initializer. We're using this special keyword, zero initializer, to say, please initialize this memory region with all zeros. Once you have arrays, you can't do much with them unless you can index specific elements of those arrays. And this is where the infamous get element pointer instruction comes into play. They are supposed to make our lives easier by giving a way to calculate pointer offsets but abstracting away some details you, wanna, you don't want to think about, like is there padding inside a struct, or what is the size of those types? So the goal here is we want to reason about indices inside an aggregate type rather than about specific byte offsets in that type. So it should be intuitive to use once you understand a few basic principles, and that's what we're gonna cover. 
the syntax for the get element pointer instruction, uh, or just gap, um, is you need to give it a base type for the first index of this gap. You need it to give it a base pointer where we're going to start our calculations from. And you need a sequence of offsets. And this is essentially one per aggregate type. It sounds a little bit confusing, but let's look at some concrete examples. Suppose you have a memory region with those values. And let's suppose you have a pointer pointing to that initial value. This is not a physical view of the memory, just a logical one. Um, if we write a gap instruction like this, saying my base type is an i32, my base pointer is this pointer, and my first index is zero, I am saying to this instruction, please return me a pointer that is offset zero elements of that base type of the instruction. In this case, this is not a very useful uh, gap because it's just giving me the exact same pointer that we started with. Right? But once we change this index, now we are starting to move to different points of our memory. So, so far, it seems simple, right? We start with a base pointer, we change an index, and we are uh, offsetting by a given type in, our, in memory. It seems simple, but I bet most of us got really confused by the first index when we were learning about gaps. And we'll see why two slides from now. Um, so one of the fundamental th things to understand is what this first index is doing. It doesn't change the, return, the, returning, the resulting pointer type, and it always offsets base on that base type that is encoded, that is written in the instruction. Why is this confusing? Well, let's look at arrays. Suppose we have this array, so just six integers, initialized to zero, and maybe our memory looks like this. We don't really care about the other values. We just have a bunch of zeros at the start of this memory chunk. And our pointer probably looks something like this. If we write a gap, just like we had before, with our base type as an array, and using our global variable as our starting pointer, using zero as the first index, we're going to get a pointer to the same memory location. But now comes a really important question. What is the type of this pointer? If you're thinking of an integer, that's why most people get confusing. It's not a pointer to an i32. It's a pointer to an array of the same type as our original pointer. To see if you're, if you, if you're following, let's change that 0 to a 1 and think about it. Where is this new pointer going to point to? Yes, it's not to the first element of the array, but in fact, probably to some out of bounds region. Why? Because the first pointer is always offsetting by that base type of having the instruction. So this first index, it is offsetting an entire array at a time. And I think most of us got confused by this when we were learning about LVMIR. So how do we get a, a pointer to a specific element of the array? Well, we have to add more indices to this gap. So while the first index is always offsetting based on that base type, all other indices are essentially stripping away a layer of aggregate type and getting a pointer inside this aggregate. Let's, let's use our previous example to understand this. So this is the situation we had. Now we're going to add an extra zero to this gap. And this extra zero is saying, get the zeroth element of the aggregate we're looking at, of the array we're looking at. So this will give us the desired pointer with the type that we expected. That is a pointer to an integer, to the first element of the array. And now we can just change that 0 to a 1, to a 2, and we're iterating over each element of the array. Gaps, as I mentioned, gaps are used to, uh, they can be used to look at aggregate types in general, and, but arrays are not the only type of aggregate we have, right? So let's look at structs and see how gaps related, relate to them. To define a struct in the LLVMIR, 
you simply need a name. And here we're gonna use percent, the percent symbol, even though it can be put into the global scope. It needs the type keyword, and it needs a list of types. So here we're defining a struct that has a character, an integer, and an array of three integers. Let's use a gap to look inside this struct. So same, we have the same struct as before. Uh, we're gonna initialize a global variable with some random initial values, and maybe our memory looks like this. So we have a pointer to the beginning of this memory chunk. If we write a get element pointer instruction with zero as the first index, as we saw before, we're gonna get a pointer of, this, of the same type into the same location as our global variable. And hopefully, by now, you're convinced that if we change that zero to a one, we're probably pointing to something out of bounds. Now, this is a legal instruction, but it's probably not what you, what you meant to write. So let's go back to zero as the first index and add an extra index there. With this, we get a pointer to the first element of our struct. If we change that zero to a one, we're getting a pointer to the second element of the struct, et cetera. So when we ask for the last element of the struct, this is, again, another aggregate type, right? This is an array. And because this is another aggregate, we can, once again, add another index to our gap. So we add a zero, and now we're asking for a pointer to the first element of the array. We can change this to a zero, a zero to a one, et cetera. Now, one thing to observe here is that when we're offsetting inside a struct, each member of the struct possibly has a different type. So this index here must be a constant. This is one of the restrictions of the uh, instruction. That is, if you're offsetting inside a struct, because each element could have a different size, those indices must be constants. So otherwise, we wouldn't know how much to offset by. And that's one of the fundamental thing, points about our gaps. Struct indices must be constants. I have one final point to make about gaps, uh, and this is where things can get be a little bit complicated, but if you understand this, you can say that you understand gaps. So to accomplish this, we're gonna, we're gonna start with two global variables. We're going to start to have a struct that has two pointers inside it, and we're gonna initialize one variable of this struct type with two pointers that is uh, two pointers to each of our global variables. So visually, we might have something like this. Uh, our two global variables might fill the first row of this memory chunk, and our struct has our two pointers in the, the last row. Our goal with this exercise will be, let's get a pointer to an i8, that is to the second element of our second global variable. In other words, I want a pointer to that five green. But we're gonna impose a new, an extra restriction. We want to start with our struct global variable. How do we do this? Well, let's start with a gap that is indexing, um, that is getting a pointer to the second element of our struct. So this pointer is probably pointing there to, to the second uh, element of the last row. Now, what is the type of this pointer? So we have a pointer to the second element of our struct, and our second element of the struct is a pointer to an array. So this gap is returning a pointer to a pointer to an array. And why am I emphasizing this point? Because I want to be able to ask this question. Can we add an extra zero to this gap? So I mentioned that extra indices of the gap always index, always look inside an aggregate type. But here, we don't have a pointer to an array, right? We have a pointer to a pointer to an array. And that's not looking at an aggregate, it's just looking at a pointer. So every index that is not the first is always trying to strip away one layer of aggregate, which is not what we had in that example. And there's an important consequence here that is gaps would never load to memory. To accomplish what we were trying to do in the previous exercise, 
we need to load that address that is stored in memory before we can continue with our exercise. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go back to what we had before. Let's load the value that is stored in that memory location. And you can see here that the result of the load is a pointer to an array. And once we have a pointer to an array, well, we have just a pointer to our second global variable, which is something we've seen how to use before, right? We're just going to write a simple gap with two indices where the first is zero, the second is, is one, and that gives us a pointer to our desired five. So this is pretty much as confusing as gaps get. If you stare at this slide long enough and convince yourself that you've understood it, you are pretty much like good to go with gaps. Some final remarks. Um, the LLVM IR is constantly changing, but we hope that we've, what we've presented today are fundamental things that are unlikely to change any time, time soon, possibly with the exception of pointers, which might be losing their types, but that shouldn't change any of the things we talked about today. So where can you go from here? Um, we didn't really talk about any of those topics. What are constants? How do you model exceptions? debug information, metadata. Um, so there are a lot more topics to explore. Um, one of the themes of uh, the, our pre-conference on Sunday and of some round tables yesterday was how can we improve our tutorials and documentations to make LLVM more accessible to beginners. We hope to have contributed somehow to this with this presentation. And you should expect a lot more improvements in the near future. Uh, in the meantime, you can look at how the optimizer or any other part of the compiler that you like manipulates IR using the LLVM APIs. That's pretty much what we had, so thank you. Questions? I have a question. If we want to some global uh, optimizations uh, or do some global uh, analysis based on the IR files, and uh, it may be cross meaning IR files, uh, but uh, I think the, for the Cron or the OPT tools, just uh, uh, compile the files uh, uh, by the module by the function or by the instruction that uh, cannot uh, get the global in information uh, mm -hmm. across um, um, uh, multi uh, files. So is there any tools or uh, do you have any suggestion? So I think what you're alluding to here is the idea of uh, link time optimizations, where you have multiple modules merged into a single um, module and run optimizations on top of that, where then you would have information about uh, global variables in different uh, modules. So I think what you're looking at is link time optimization, and we definitely have that in, in LLVM. Uh, but the link optimization will are based on the uh, ARD linker or the GNU linker. Uh, but we, we just wanted to uh, do some analysis based on IR files. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, uh, uh, please uh, uh, switch to the. Uh, uh, I think uh, there's a uh, uh, LLVM linker. Yes. It, it can combine uh, uh, IR files to, to, to one IR files. Yeah, sorry, I'm getting there. Um, yeah, if you merge all of your modules into a single unit using the linker, you can probably also achieve what you're trying to do here. Uh, but uh, is it uh, because uh, uh, different uh, files can contain different uh, debug infos, like the file names or the line infos? If we combine uh, to one uh, files, uh, it will lose the original files in the debug info? It shouldn't. As far as I know, it shouldn't. Please, someone correct me if I'm wrong. But you shouldn't lose any debug information by just linking modules together. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for the nice talk. 
Uh, I wanted to get back on the discussion about fee nodes, the use of uh, allocas, the use of global variables, etc. Mm -hmm. um, in the general case, uh, do you think uh, is it better to to stick to fee nodes to use fee nodes and let the backend uh, uh, do the? I mean. It is the backend that better knows what kind of uh, what what is the better what what is the the best way to what is the best code to generate yes. uh, the, the uh, register allocation etc. Et Or do you think about special cases where it, it would be better to use global variables to avoid fee, fee nodes? I mean, in the in, in the general case, wouldn't mm -hmm. wouldn't it be better to use fee nodes? Yeah, so I, I showed it the other way around here, but what usually happens is the front end will will generate allocates for you, and some mem uh, optimizer passes like mem to reg will convert those allocates into registers, potentially creating fee nodes along the way. Now, what, about what, what's better? It really depends on your target, right? But as a general, as a general um, principle, we start with allocates, convert every, everything we can to registers, and then optimize from there. Yeah, like we, because we, here we have infinite registers, right? But once we get to the back end, then you have information about how many registers you have, what is the pressure like, and do I need to put something on the stack or not? That's, that will, those will be decisions from the back end. More questions? This one in the front. Yeah. So if you're trying to make sense of what uh, LLVM IR actually means, what optimizer level would you uh, recommend for a human? <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess that depends on how, how complex your code is. But it, it can get messy, right? Um, if we change this to O3, I think you'll get something you probably don't recognize at all, uh, assuming you have internet. Um, yeah, so like it's it's completely different, right? Um, there's probably some vectorization going on here, and so I usually start with no optimization <laughs> and then go from there. <laughs> no problem. A nice talk. Thank you, you said that uh, five nodes should be at the start of a block. Is that really yes. enforced, or is it just a good practice? Uh, no, that's uh, uh, that's uh, that's part of the definition of a basic block. Every instruction has to uh, the first instruction of a basic block must be a fee node if it exists. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There's a question in front. A question in your experience, at least in our experience, uh, the. Finals, the order of finals at uh, sometimes changes the behavior of uh, optimization uh, for later coaching. Um, but this time sometimes is not uh, deterministic. Um, what we experienced, for instance, sometimes some unrelated change that will have the order of finals at the beginning of the basic block changed such that, um, yeah, we will create a different uh, result. Uh, yeah, not a simulation error, but uh, the, the, the later result will be quite different. Do you have such kind of experience? Uh, so what, is it, what exactly is different? The, the final IR that gets generated? Or, uh, yeah, the fun note order. Uh, oh, the order of the fee notes? Yeah. No? That's a good question, I, I honestly. You, you, no, I've never seen that. Nobody has this kind of experience. Mm. Yeah, okay. I, I, sorry. <laughs> it looks like the definition of a structure is logical. It's not uh, linked to the, layout, to the final layout of the structure. So I guess that this kind of information must be added in a later pass. And then my question is, uh, do you have some, are there some instructions that works in, uh, for example, getting the second byte of a structure, whatever is the structure behavior or not? 
So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm clear, but uh, can you bypass the type system, for example? I mean, uh, so one of the instructions we didn't cover here is how you cast pointers to different types. So in a way, you could always cast your pointer from whatever type it is to an I8 pointer and just offset from there. You can also convert form pointers to integers and back to pointers. So you can do all sorts of those tricks, but information about the, the, the lay, data layout itself is in the data layout string. It depends on the target, right? Um, one thing you can express is that you might want your struct to be packed. So you can just add angle brackets to the struct definition, and that would give you uh, a packed struct for whatever definition of packed you have. Uh, any more questions? That was cool. Okay. Uh, Vince, Felipe, thank you very much. Very clear. Thank you.